Hello, everybody, and welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we are scaling up in water treatment knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. My name is Trace Blackmore, and I am your host for Scaling Up, and I am delighted that us water treatment folk finally have a podcast just for us. I mean, think about it. How much windshield time do we have? We're going from account to account. It's the perfect platform for us to learn how to be better water treaters. And that's my job, to try to challenge you to do that and bring you information that you want to hear that is going to make you better in this industry, which in turn is going to make us all better. So I'm going to throw this web address out probably 600 times during this show, but I want to make sure that you go to it. It's www scalinguph2o.com. Scalinguph2o.com is our site and it's where you're going to tell me what you think about this show. What do you want to hear about? I'm going to ask you to ask me questions so we can answer them later in the show. So please go on there and ask me those questions. I hope to have guest speakers on. So who do you want me to interview? So anything that's about this show that you want to hear, please let me know. If uh, I don't have that information, it's going to be a very short-lived show. And, I, and I, hope, uh, I hope this is well embraced by the water treatment industry. So please help me help you. So as I said, this is our first broadcast. Now, I did put an introductory uh, episode up just saying that, hey, we were getting a broadcast. But uh, this is the very first podcast I've never done this before. Thank you to all the people that have helped me get uh, my studio set up and everything set up online so we could come this far. And that being said, uh, trying to come up with a format. So what makes sense for scaling up and bringing this information to you? So the, the information that uh, I'm gonna lay out is basically in this format. So first off uh, is announcements of what's going on in the industry. So those primarily are gonna be what AWT has to offer and things that you might not be aware of that you could take advantage of. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll move over to a section that I like to call the catalyst. And just like in chemistry, the catalyst speeds up a reaction. The reaction that I'm hoping it speeds up in you is it motivates you to be better. So these might be tips or tricks or just things to think about that you say, huh, I'm going to try that out and perhaps that's going to make you think about something else. So the goal of this is you're going to be a better water treater tomorrow than you are today. Then we'll move into either a main presentation. If you guys have a topic that you want me to explore, uh, of course, you know where to go. If you do have a topic you want me to explore, that's scalinguph2o.com. There's another shameless plug. Uh, but it also might be an interview. So if there is somebody that you want me to interview, I would be happy to get them on the show. So let me know about that. Then we move to a section that I call pinks and blues. And this is simply your questions that you want to have answered. So how would you ask those questions you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked because you would go to scalinguph2o.com. Uh, and then there's a section on the website that will tell you, hey, go ahead and click here and you can submit your questions and don't worry, I will keep your name anonymous. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I also don't want anybody to be embarrassed to ask these questions because this is how we're going to make this show awesome. We're going to answer the questions that you want answered. And then finally, we'll wrap up. So that's how I see the show going. I'm sure as we uh, figure out what the magic formula is, that might alter a little bit. But for now, that's what we're going with. So let's go ahead and start with industry updates. So those of you that went to training for AWT, you already know this. Those of you who have not, you have missed a golden opportunity. So every year, two times, the Association of Water Technologies offers technical training and then also what we call fundamentals and applications training. And what that is, those are two separate classes, but it's three days of action-packed water treatment extravaganza. I mean, it is everything that uh, you really need to get jump-started in water treatment. It's gonna challenge how you do things. It's gonna give you ideas of how to do things. 
Uh, if you're over in the technical training, it's a great way to start prepping for your certified water technologist exam. And uh, it, it's just a great opportunity. So if you haven't been, I hope that you look up the website, which is uh, awt.org, awt.org, and see that there are opportunities next year. So hopefully you can get signed up for that. I have the pleasure of being one of the trainers there. So I look forward to meeting you in person next year. And there's a new program that AWT is offering online. It's called The Learning Source. There's several water treatment modules on uh, their website, and you can take those. For those CWTs out there, you can actually get credits towards your uh, CWT for those CEUs that you need. Uh, so you might want to check that out. I mentioned CWT. It's my hope that everybody listening to this podcast is either a CWT or you have plans to get your CWT. As we do more podcasts, I'm gonna talk more about that, why that's so important, and hopefully urge all of you to say, hey, I'm in this business, I'm gonna be the best I can in this business, and one way I can prove that to people is I can get that certified water technologist designation. Uh, last thing about AWT is uh, the annual convention is coming up in September, September 13th through 16th in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hopefully, I will see you there. I'm planning on doing a recording there on site, uh, talk to a couple of the attendees, ask them how things are going, what they're getting out of the convention, and even make my way around the uh, convention hall to talk to some of the vendors to see what they're offering new this year to try to keep you up to date on that. So that brings us to the section called the catalyst. And the catalyst in chemistry is simply something that speeds up a reaction. It's doing the same thing here. I hope the reaction that it speeds up is it speeds up your willingness, your desire to go out and learn more about a particular topic. My whole goal with this podcast is to make us all better water treaters. And if I can get you thinking about that one thing that is the catalyst to something else, I feel that I've done my job. So today, I thought that we would talk about your test kit. This is the thing that we lug to every single account. We lovingly leave it in our cars when it's 100 degrees outside or 20 degrees outside. Please don't do that with your test kits. They don't like that. I know you're out there though. So uh, if you are doing that, realize that a lot of those things in your test kit are temperature sensitive. Give them the love that they deserve. Take them in your house, take it back in the office when they're gonna be in a, a really harsh environment. So my question for you is, do you know why you're actually doing the test that you're running? And if the answer is because my boss told me so, the answer is no. I want you to focus, instead of just running tasks, i.e. test, to truly become a water treater and understand how your tests work and why you run them. It is possible that your test could actually lie to you. What do I mean by lie to you? That's just weird. But no, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So if there's an issue and you're testing for that issue and don't even realize it, your tests are gonna indicate that and you're, they're gonna throw off what you think you know about that system. And it could be an example, let's say you took a sample out of a line that has not been exercised in a while and you're not really getting system water, you're getting the water that's been stuck in that pipe for the last six months. So my catalyst moment for you today is to ask yourself why. I hope you ask yourself why on everything that you do because those are some great conversations that you can have with your employers or your mentors or whoever. Hey, I'm doing this thing, but I don't really understand why I'm doing it. Can you, can you explain more about it? And it's a great way to start the conversation. But today, I'm gonna focus on the test kit. And I want you to ask why you're running every single test that you're running. If you don't know, again, that's a great conversation to have. Also, why do your test do the things that they do? So what's the chemistry involved? And, and I'm gonna be the first to admit it, I geek out over chemistry and math. I'm, I'm that guy, so for, for what it's worth, I've warned you, that's just how it is. I enjoy knowing the chemistry behind the tests 
but sometimes we don't know. And sometimes we don't even know where to find that information. So I'm gonna give you a website. It's uh, www.hoch.com. Okay, that will take you to the Hawk website. So where I want you to go is uh, hawk.com forward slash WHA. That stands for the Water Analysis Handbook. And that is a wealth of information that tells you absolutely everything about every test that you'll probably ever run in water treatment. It's all alphabetized. You can look it up very easily. And you're probably saying, but Trace, I don't use Hawk tests. And I get that. There are many great manufacturers out there. There's Masters, there's Aquaphoenix, there's Taylor, uh, Lamont. I'm sure I'm missing some and I apologize, but they're all wonderful tests. There are some tests that are unique to that company, but the majority of all of our tests are just how they produce them. So what I'm telling you in the water analysis handbook, you can actually learn how these tests work. They're gonna tell you things like procedures, they're gonna talk about interferences. So what, what's in my water that this test that I'm running can actually interfere with? When I say interfere, that means it's gonna mess up the result. And uh, one that comes to mind is iron. So what's something that I can do to get some of that iron out of my sample so I can have a better test? Again, this is all predicated under the question, why? So. Let's talk about that. How many people out there have actually run a hardness test and you get what's called a lagging end result? So it starts to change color from, from red to blue and then it, it doesn't and it just keeps on and keeps on doing that. So at technical training, Frank LaCrone actually explains what's going on here. And, uh, and gives everybody a tip. So I am going to share that tip that he gave to the audience at the Association of Water Technologies technical training. And what it is, is that there's, there's iron in the, in the water and it is interfering with the test and it's not allowing the titrant to work with the color indicator to tie everything up the way it needs to. So his tip is very simple. And let me back up a little bit. Have you ever thought on your tests, how many drops you put in? Why do I put in eight drops? Why don't I put in nine drops or 10 drops or 20 drops? And then you move on to maybe a color indicator and then you move on to you know the titration. Well, ask yourself those questions. And what happens if I put 20 drops in? Let me go into my lab or kitchen sink or wherever you are and actually experiment around that. Remember your tests are your tools. They're your tools so you know you can figure out what's going on with the system. So that being said, let's get back to our issue at hand. The, uh, the hardness kit having a problem with iron. So what he suggests, instead of going in order where you add say so many drops of buffer, and then you add your hardness indicator, and then you start titrating. And by the way, that titrant is EDTA. EDTA is a keelant, which means it wants to tie up stuff. And in this test, you want it to tie up all of the hardness so that indicator goes from red to blue. But that iron is interfering with that because the EDTA is working on that iron instead of the hardness. So let's get that iron out of the way. And what you can do is you can add one drop of EDTA before you do anything else with your sample. Now you need to count that drop in the end and then go ahead and prepare your sample the exact same way. Put your buffer in, put your indicator in, and then go ahead and titrate starting with that one drop, of course. What happened is that EDTA has tied up that iron and now you don't have that issue anymore. You can do little tips and tricks with all of your tests if you understand, one, what your tests are telling you and truly what the reactions are. So it's a great conversation to have. Why do your tests do what you do and how do I learn them better? And by the way, folks, if you are not using your tests as a tool and you're kind of using them as your master when you go to service, you're kind of missing the point. Have you ever heard, uh, those of you that have had chemistry classes, you know, we all use the empirical method. Well, what the heck is the empirical method? Well, quite simply, we observe something 
And then we make a determination on what we think is going on. We form a hypothesis. And then we test that hypothesis to see if it's true or not true. And then we make adjustments. And that's what a service is. So apply that type of thinking the next time you go in service and walk around the mechanical room and say, hey, what are my senses telling me? Oh, wait a second, that pump isn't primed. So if that's your inhibitor pump and you're testing for inhibitor before you even bring out your test kit, aren't you going to expect that that is going to be low? So the tower's overflowing. They just cleaned the cooling tower. All these various things, you are forming a hypothesis, a theory on what you think all those tests are going to tell you. And now your tests are simply making you a better water treater. Your tests are gonna confirm or disprove what you think is going on with the system. And then with that data, you can then make the changes that you need to, to get that system back in line or verify that it was always in line. I challenge you to please use your test kits as the tool as they were intended to be. The next section up is uh, the presentation or the interview. And this is the bulk of our podcast. And being our first show, I really wanted to have somebody on the show that was, uh, that was inspiring and, and would really, uh, really light up the, the show. Because I've got a lot of people that uh, urged me to do this and they gave me a lot of information on uh, how I should do it. So I asked them, who should my first guest be? And they all said the same thing. And I got to tell you, the person that they told me to interview, I never even thought of. And I didn't think it was a good idea at first. Uh, the person that they recommended was me. So first of all, that sounds pretty weird, doesn't it? How am I going to interview me? That's, that sounds very narcissistic. And, and I'm going to be the first to admit I do not like talking about myself. And I said that to them. I said, well, that's just weird. Why, why would you suggest that? And they said, well, well, Trace, you need to look at it this way. You're basically interviewing for a job. These people are going to commit to subscribe to your podcast and listen to you an hour a month. So why should they do that? If they don't know who you are, then why? And I thought about that and I was like, well, okay, well, when you put it that way, it doesn't seem so awkward. So I'm not gonna ask myself questions and then change positions around my microphone and answer them because that's just goofy. But in this spirit, I thought I would go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. So hopefully you choose to subscribe to this program and then we join on this journey together to make both of us better water treaters. That's probably what I'm gonna start out with. Why did I start this podcast? Um, I, I will tell you, I absolutely love the business of water treatment. Uh, my father uh, taught me this business, and I'm gonna talk about him in a second, but I, I, I've never been bored. Uh, water treatment's been very good to me, and I feel that this is a way to give back. I'm not that selfless, so don't go there quite yet. One of the things I can do is, is give back to this great career, this industry of water treatment that has given me so much. And um, you know, just like I hope that this is a tool to advance your water treatment knowledge, when you ask me questions and I have uh, guests um, on the show, it's going to enhance my knowledge as well. Uh, in order for me to explain something uh, that you uh, right up, I haven't mentioned scaling up h2o.com for a while, so I'll go ahead and do that there. Uh, but when you ask me a question, if I don't know the answer, or if I'm not sure that that's the best way to answer that, I've got to research it. So in turn, that's making me better. That's one of the reasons that, uh, that I started this podcast. The other one, and as I mentioned before, it's just an industry that lends itself so well to this format. We're driving around so much, it's really hard to read an article. Uh, because we're always on the go. And with the podcast, we can simply download it, listen to it in our cars, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully get something out of it. One of my favorite quotes is uh, John F. Kennedy, and he says, a rising tide raises all boats. I truly believe that there, there are some water treaters out there that probably should not be in this industry. Uh, but for those of us that are trying to do the best that we can, I want to speak to you and I want to try to challenge you to get better each and every day. If I do that, the entire industry gets better, and in turn, I get better. That's kind of the philosophy and why I started this podcast. 
To back up, to talk about how I got involved in the water treatment industry, is uh, it's my dad. And unfortunately, my dad is, is no longer with us. But uh, when I was growing up, my, my dad was a water treater. So it's the industry that I kind of grew up in. Uh, in fact, if you read the About the Host section on ScalingUpH2O.com, you'll actually, I actually tell this story. But uh, my first water treatment memory is I was with my dad and I was five years old. We were in a hospital, an account that he had, and he was boiling a sample on a hot plate. And for some reason, I reached up and I burned my right hand on his hot plate. Now, no permanent damage. I guess it hurt enough that I still remember this story to today. Throughout junior high and high school, I would run tests for my dad on his kitchen, on our kitchen table. And uh, granted, exactly what I was telling you to do was what I, what I wasn't doing. Uh, I was just simply adding this many drops to this many drops and counting the, the titrant and using that on a multiplier and filling out a report form. Now, of course, my dad knew what to do with those numbers. And more importantly, he also knew when those numbers weren't right. So he would say, you need to run this one again. And I was just fascinated that he could do that. Uh, in fact, um, I've got this whole, uh, I share this at AWT, uh, this procedure that I've come up with to figure out uh, how big a system is. And uh, my dad could had this knack where he could just step back and look at the system piping. Granted, he could only see what's in the mechanical room and uh, know about the size of the building. And he would come in a couple hundred gallons every time. It, it drove me nuts. But, but something about my dad is he instilled upon me that this is an awesome industry and it was very good to him it's been very good to me but as i was getting started out in it he told me that you're always learning in this industry and if there is ever a day when you're not learning or you feel you know it all it's the day you need to quit and find something else and uh, i think that's the respect that this industry deserves I would say that there are a lot of water treaters out there that have learned about a year's worth of experience and then they stopped learning and they might have been in the industry for 10 years. Well, they repeated that one year 10 times over. So if I'm speaking to you, I hope that this sort of lights a spark so you can, you can advance yourself a little bit more. That's going to help the entire industry but always be learning. That's, uh, that's the message that I'm hoping to get from that. And that's, that's what my, my father shared with me. I guess that brings us to um, how I got started in uh, working for a water treatment company. When I went to school, I actually got out and I was in the financial planning industry for about two years. I, I wasn't bad at the job, but I had no passion for it at all. Like I said, I was doing okay, but I, I just didn't enjoy it. It didn't excite me. And my dad and I were having dinner one night and I told him about this and he said, well, why don't you do water treatment? You really seem to enjoy that when uh, you were working with me. And, and I really said this to my dad. I said, uh, I looked at him and I said, well, dad, that's not a real job. That's just something I did in high school. And uh, he actually didn't hit me after that. So that was that was fun. Uh, but he looked at me and uh, and he, he laughed a little bit and he said, well, well, son, I assure you it is a real job. And in fact, it's why you had a house and you were able to eat food while you were growing up. Uh, and it's just so happened that he needed a service person at the moment. And uh, he said, I'm willing to give it a try if you're willing to give it a try. And, and that spark that I didn't have before with financial planning, I think I got it my, my first day uh, working with him in water treatment. And, and I got to tell you, I, I was so fortunate to be able to work with him and share the passion that he had for this industry. Uh, who knew that uh, that unlocked a passion for me to want to want to teach it as well. And then uh, I, I worked for uh, worked for him for a while uh, and then he retired and then eventually I decided to, to start my own company, which is Blackmore Enterprises. Uh, Blackmore Enterprises is located in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually coming to you live from the Blackmore Enterprises studio. Uh, that being said, we're, uh, we're a water treatment company, just like you guys, uh, but I try to follow the principles that my father taught me, and, and I'm very proud about that. Also, uh, because I am that math and, and chemistry geek, um, I really I, I do some consulting with uh, other water treatment companies as well. So, um, you know, maybe somebody might have me in to um, uh, their concern that a large account that they have 
you know, might have some vulnerabilities. So they invite me in to figure out what those are so they can correct them. Uh, I do training for companies where, and I told you that, that's my favorite thing to do where they'll invite me in. Maybe they have a bunch of people that are getting ready to take the CWT or they have a bunch of new people and uh, I'll go in and do a, a special training program for them based around water treatment. So consulting things like that, um, some training things like that. Uh, oh, uh, corrosion coupons. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little about corrosion coupons in another show. Just to say, if you are not using corrosion coupons on every system, you are guessing on how your water treatment program is working. Uh, we have very clear standards in this industry. And if you are not staying within those standards or you don't know if you're in those standards, you don't know what's going on with your system. So it was with that that I've always used corrosion coupons and I would send them off, and I'm not gonna mention the name of who I sent them off to, but uh, that being said, I would just get a report back that would say simply that the mills per year, and it would say whether I had pitting or not. And I guess that was fine, but as a, as a water treater, there's so much more information that we can tell off of a corrosion coupon on you know, what's actually going on in the system and how are little changes affecting that and I just wasn't getting that in the report. So uh, I decided that we were gonna invest a little bit of money and we did a, uh, we have a little small metallurgical lab here. We can look at corrosion coupons and really tell what's going on with the systems. And uh, through uh, back and forth uh, consultation with uh, the owners of the coupons, I might say, try this, or they said, hey, we tried this and these are the coupons for that. And we can really tell what's going on. That, that's something we do as well. Uh, I, I guess that, that's pretty much uh, it about Blackmore Enterprises. Uh, I am very proud that it is my company. And uh, I tell you, you don't know what you don't know. And when I started my own business, boy, did I not know a lot and I didn't know what I didn't know. So uh, I joined several organizations that were geared around business and teaching the business owner these items that they don't know. So throughout later shows, I'm probably gonna bring some of that information in because I, uh, I think that lends itself well to any listener, whether you own a company or you're just working in a company. Let's talk about AWT. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm also very passionate about the Association of Water Technologies. I was actually the president of the Association of Water Technologies in 2011. And I got to tell you, that was an extremely humbling experience. Some, uh, I mentioned my dad, but um, uh, other members, specifically uh, uh, Bruce Ketrick Sr., Jay Farmery, who I consider to be my mentors, um, you know, to be able to work with them and then hold the position of, of president. Um, for, for those of you that remember Rain's World, uh, I'm not worthy, that's kind of how I felt. But uh, I got through it and, and I loved it. I, I had a great time, of, I learned a lot, uh, learned about my own business uh, working in the Association of Water Technologies. But that being said, uh, how, how did I even get started? How does somebody become president in the Association of Water Technologies? I guess that's kind of a blur. Let me, let me think back about that. Actually, I do remember the story. So it was the first convention that I attended as uh, owning my own company. And it was in Palm Springs, California. And Jay Farmery was the president. And I remember I had an issue with the marketing material. It, 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 was, it was just bad. And I remember uh, it didn't even tell you how to get to the hotel. I, I just thought there was so much more that we could do because Palm Springs had so much to offer. And it wasn't in any of the material, all the things that you could do besides the actual convention. So I went up to Jay and I said, hey, Jay, I, I think we could do a better job in this marketing material. And, you know, Jay looked at it and goes, yeah, you're definitely right. You know, I'm looking for a committee chair for the uh, communications and marketing committee. And uh, that's you now. I, I, I didn't know enough that I could say no. And. I think two weeks later, I was uh, hosting my first conference call as chair of the Marketing and Communications Committee. But I tell you, that, uh, that was the catalyst for um, actually getting involved with the Association of Water Technology. I was sort of thrown into the deep end, I guess. Uh, so I don't know if I recommend that or not, but I'm living proof that I survived uh, that method. The Marketing and Communications Committee uh, was very unique because we really didn't have our own product. Our job was to sell everything or communicate 
all the products that the other committees had. So because of that, I learned so much about the organization because all the committees would report back to us on what we needed to be doing. Yes, I, uh, I guess I ran that committee for about uh, six, six years, I think it was. And then somebody nominated me to the board of directors. Um, actually, a couple years before uh, I came off that committee, I was, I was still on the marketing committee. Uh, I went on the board of directors. Uh, but anyway, I was nominated and the membership saw fit to elect me. Thank you for that. And uh, I spent six years on the board of the Association of Water Technologies and then came back recently for another two year term because there was a vacancy there. Very dedicated to the organization. Uh, I know you hear everybody say, hey, get involved. And, you know, really, how do you get involved? Well, I told you how I got involved, but honestly, uh, just reaching out. Uh, there's plenty of things to do. Truly, the more you give, the more you get back. And I know that everybody says that, but I would not be the water treater that I am today had I not got involved with the Association of Water Technologies. I definitely wouldn't be able to have people like Jay Farmery and Bruce Ketrick Sr. on my speed dial to ask the questions on, hey, I have this issue. And they say, oh, I've messed that up 10 times in, in the past. So this is what you do so you don't have to make that mistake. Uh, that was all because of the Association of Water Technologies. So this water treater, definitely it took a village to, uh, to, to get to the point where I am today. And, and the AWT definitely was that village. A little bit about me. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can put all this together um, in, in the podcast to uh, help lift everybody up that's listening to this. Um, the questions, the topics that I have right now, I have received from the technical training seminars. Um, I think I've answered most of the questions at the technical training seminars, but like I said, it's six days of information squeezed into three days. So you really can't elaborate on a lot of this stuff. So when I felt I wasn't doing justice to the question, I would make note of that. And, and that's where these notes are coming from. The, um, and then uh, it might also be the, the convention, you know, items that I got there. Uh, again, I am going to run out of these ideas and topics if you guys don't help me out. So once again, scaling up H2O and um, that will, uh, and if you could, you know, give me some ideas, give me some questions and uh, we'll go ahead and see if, uh, if we can keep this show going for some time. All right, so I guess that wasn't too awkward. I, I, I don't like talking about myself, but um, I, I tell you, I do like telling you about my father and what a, what a good influence he was on my life. And you know, like I said, water treatment's been extremely good to me and I wouldn't even be in this industry if, uh, if it weren't for him. So uh, I'm glad they made that suggestion. I hope, uh, I hope you guys, that interview wasn't too terribly painful. Uh, we'll get somebody more interesting the next time we do that. That's uh, my promise to you. So let's move to the section pinks and blues. And this is where we answer the questions that you have. Uh, again, I'm gonna keep these anonymous. And these are some questions that uh, some people have actually already gone to the website or they asked me at the uh, technical training that I'm gonna try to answer for you. So first, how do you accurately calculate cycles in a cooling tower? Well, uh, and I guess that question, um, let me sort of, let me answer that question because I don't like the word cycles. Um, and I like words that define themselves and cycles doesn't really define itself. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I, th I think you do if I explain it. So you're talking with a customer and you're telling them how things concentrate up and only pure water evaporates, leaving its solids behind. And eventually the water gets to a point where it can't hold any more solids and it starts to precipitate and that's how we start scale. And that's of course why we have a cooling tower controller that's controlling the bleed uh, because the solution to pollution is dilution. That's something my dad used to say. Uh, so we are actually opening up the, the high solids tower water and bleeding that out. So we have low solids makeup water coming in and diluting it out. And we explain that to the customer and we say, based on all the tests that we've done on your raw water and the chemistries that we're running, we can get five cycles or 10 cycles or whatever it is. And, uh, and then they say, okay, I understand. And then you ask them a question or they repeat it back to you and they say, oh, well, well cycles is how many times the water's recirculated around in the system. 
I can't tell you how many times I've actually had that happen to me. So I decided that I was going to use another industry term for that and call that concentration ratio. So exactly the same thing that I said, but call it concentration ratio. It's how many times the makeup water has concentrated up that we've allowed it to do before the, the, the bleed happens. So uh, the calculation for that is would be the, the tower, whatever you're testing, divided by the makeup water, whatever you're testing. So the question is, how do we accurately do that? And I think this question came from uh, when we were talking about this in our fundamentals and applications class. And I said, I wasn't a fan of doing that on conductivity. And, uh, and I'm not. And, and the, um, the question is, uh, I think if this is where that question came from, well, hey, that's how we're controlling the concentration ratio is off of this conductivity on the cooling tower controller. So why not we test for that? by all means, do the calculation and see what it is. But remember, conductivity is the sum of the parts. So everything that's going into that cooling tower is going to be measured in your conductivity. So what a lot of us do is we choose a non-scaling chloride or a non-scaling ion like chloride. Go ahead and, and, and test what's in the tower, divide that by what's in the raw. And then that will give us a more accurate concentration ratio. So what if you're using sodium hypochlorite? Well, obviously you can't use chloride because you're getting chloride contribution with your sodium hypochlorite. So then you have to choose another non-scaling ion. I tell you here in Atlanta, we really don't have a silica issue. Uh, so our silica is anywhere between three to six parts per million. And, um, you know, Fair, with, without, without going into too much chemistry, you can concentrate that up to about 150 parts per million. So there's no way we're going to concentrate a cooling tower up 50 times. So we use silica to actually determine what our concentration ratio is. And then we back that up with the conductivity to make sure that our cooling tower controller is set properly. Uh, I hope that answers that question a little bit better. I probably uh, talked a little bit too much uh, around that question, but hopefully, hopefully that gave you what you were asking for. All right, so next question up, can you give some sales advice when it comes to water treatment? And uh, that's actually a show idea that I have. Uh, I'm gonna do a show around sales and, and water treatment. Uh, but my, my advice is, you know, what image comes to mind when you think of a salesman? Probably it's not a very positive one. So my advice is be the opposite of that. I, I tell people that work for me and uh, especially new people, they say, hey, do you have a script? And I don't like scripts because that's saying that everything is canned and it's all one size fits all. And, and that's one of the cool things about water treatment. Everything is unique. And the fact that we have the ability to go in there and look at a system and diagnose what's been going on for years in some cases and say, no, that's wrong. And that's why you've been having your issue. That's pretty cool. And by the way, if you can do that, you've sold that account. To, to answer that question, the, the advice that I have is, you know, be the best that you can be in this industry and make sure people know that that's one of your goals. You know, how, how are you showing that? Do you have your certified water technologist? And, and do, they, do they know that? Do they know what that is? But I, I guess the, the biggest uh, piece of advice that I could probably give you is if you care about what you do and you care about taking care of that customer and whatever issue that they're having, that's your script. That's your premise on what you're going on. And it doesn't matter what you say, as long as it comes out of that mindset, it's going to be the right thing. And if you can convey that to somebody, I guarantee that you sold that account. All right, another question, do you use corrosion coupons? Well, I, I think I already, already asked, uh, already answered that. So um, um, the answer is yes. And um, I'll just do one more plug for corrosion coupons. If you're not using corrosion coupons on all your systems, you are guessing on what's going on with the corrosion rates. Now you might, the, when you get the chiller opened up uh, every year, you know, you're probably, oh geez, I hope it looks good. My tests look good, but I don't know what that chiller is looking like. Well, 
that chiller is your corrosion coupon or that heat exchanger is your corrosion coupon if you don't have those in the system to tell you periodically on a proactive approach what's going on. So I hope you consider that. Another question is how do I get my CWT? So the CWT is the highest designation that a water treater can receive in this industry. It stands for the Certified Water Technologist, the designation. And um, uh, if you go on awt.org, uh, there is a wonderful packet that you can print out or view online. It tells you absolutely everything that you need to know about the entire process. Uh, I urge you to go on there. Uh, but um, uh, you need five years of industry experience and there are some things that uh, uh, you can do to actually minimize that. So you might qualify for that. Those are in that packet. There's uh, an exam that you have to pass. Oh, by the way, for those of you that know Angela Pike, it is an exam. If you ask her a question about the CWT test, you're going to get a 10 minute dissertation about what the difference is from an examination and a test. So I'm just going to, going to warn you right now. And, and Angela is wonderful at, at, at what she does and we, we thank her for doing it. Uh, so uh, there's letters of recommendation that you need to get. Uh, there is a code of ethics that you need to sign. All this is available online that you can read. Uh, and then finally, when you actually get it, every five years, you need so many uh, continuing education units in order to keep that current. We're advertising as the AWT, so end users are looking for the Certified Water Technologist designation. I have seen uh, specifications that actually say must have a Certified Water Technologist designation in order to bid on this. So if you don't have plans to take this, I hope you change your plans. And uh, I'm going to do some shows where I, I have some tips uh, on, on how you can do that. But, uh, uh, you know, how do you get your CWT is the actual question. So one, you got to want to do it and uh, go online, figure out what that takes. And my advice to you, whoever wrote this question, is that however many years you need in order to take that examination is you set that date. So let's say that's five years into the future, go five years into the future and say, hey, I'm going to take my CWT exam on this date and now work backwards. You've got something that you're working towards and you're working towards that goal. So how do you get it? You start on it and hopefully that'll help you. Okay. <laughs> so, OK, the last question that uh, I'll read says, do you really dive with sharks? All right. So I uh, this is from somebody that saw my presentation. Um, uh, I do the math presentation. I'm the math guy. I teach that at AWT. Um, by the way, that's the funnest math class that you'll ever take. At least I think so anyway. But I show a picture of sharks because everybody's scared of math. And I show the picture where my wife and I are in the Bahamas and we're diving with 35 uh, Caribbean uh, reef tip sharks. Still have all my fingers and toes. And uh, yes, that was not a fake picture. That was really my wife and I diving with sharks. And uh, I am a scuba diver. In fact, I'm a scuba dive instructor. So I'm really serious when I say uh, water treatment is, is truly a passion for me because uh, not only do I work in water treatment, but my hobby is water. So, so there you go. So, uh, so yeah, I, I really did dive with sharks. That is our first episode of Scaling Up. So I hope you enjoyed it. I promise as we go throughout this series, I will get better. I'll definitely have better guests on. Um, but again, the only way that I am going to be able to do that is if you help me make this show what it needs to be. And that, of course, I'm going to say it again, is going to scalinguph2o.com and let me know what you're thinking about. What do you want me to talk about? Who do you want me to interview? What are some questions that you have? If you do that, this show will be wildly successful. You will get the information out of it that you want. And I will be very happy because I'm now doing something that I love. And that's making sure that a rising tide raises all ships and we're all getting better as water treaters. Thanks for joining me on Scaling Up.